Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is the uh, planning board uh, meeting for August 15th, uh, 2023. Uh, actually, this meeting was supposed to have taken place on August 1st, uh, but because of the lack of notice in the Granite State News, um, we were not able to hold the meeting. Uh, so we then rescheduled it for August 15th. Uh, again, the Granite State News forgot to put in uh, the legal notice, but uh, we did get a legal notice in the Laconia and the Conway paper. Uh, so uh, we also then put a notice in the Granite State News uh, this past Thursday on August 10th. So let me introduce the members of the planning board. Uh, Von Dugan is, is not here. She's on, on vacation. Um, Peter Goodwin is down to my, my left, uh, sitting next to Peter Roger Murray. Uh, Doug Braskin is the vice chairman. Um, my name is Kathy Barnard. And uh, Jane Nielsen is a, an alternate. Brad Harriman is the uh, representative from the Board of Selectmen, and uh, Julie Jacobs is also uh, an alternate. Uh, the Willow Street uh, application that was to have been heard this uh, today was a, an eight-unit condo project, uh, but it will not be heard. Uh, it will be re rescheduled. It has been withdrawn and will be rescheduled. Uh, okay, I now have to recuse myself, so I'm going to turn this over to Doug. Thanks, Doug. All right. Uh, so the first hearing we'll have this evening is for the uh, Eastern Lakes Region Housing Coalition. Uh, this is uh, case number 2023-14. Uh, as we're down, a couple of planning board members. Uh, Jane Nielsen, would you be willing to sit for this application? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and uh, Julie Jacobs, would you also be willing to sit? Yes, I will. Very good. So we'll have a full compliment. Uh, Doug, right at the beginning of this, I'd just like to, like I did for the pre-app discussion that we had with this, that uh, um, I did own property there, um, right next door. You know, budding the property here has been sold for about three years now. So as long as the board's okay with it, I know I'm open-minded enough that I'm, you know, would be able to hear the case. And, and uh, unless the board would request me to recuse myself, I'd like to sit in on it, so. Yeah, I have no objections. Anybody um, else on the board have any objection? None whatsoever. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, so as I was saying, this is case number 2023-14, tax map lot number 176020001. The submission date was July 11th, 2023, and uh, this is the site plan review. Uh, we will first hear from the applicant who will explain the application to us. At that time, the planning board members can ask questions until they're comfortable getting their answers. We'll then determine if the application is complete. If it is, I'll ask for a motion to mm -hmm. accept the application as complete. At that point, we can open the public hearing. During the public hearing, if members of the public could try and keep their remarks to five minutes or less, we would appreciate it. Uh, and to close of the public hearing, we'll ask the planner if he has any conditions of approval, close the hearing, and then deliberate. And we have somebody to Very speak good. for it. Sorry, we thought we were second in line, so we're, we'll uh, set up while I give a brief uh, summary here. We were here in, oh, sorry, my name's Steve Dwyer. Turn, I'm going to be- Are you turned on? Yes, he is. I believe so, let me. Better? Up, uh, yes. You need, to, you need to be very close very to close. the, yeah. Because okay. this doesn't work when it's like this. So my name is Steve Dwyer. I will be the project. I am the project manager for Harriman Hill Phase Three, working with Lakes Region Community Developers. We were here in mid-July to give a preview of the project, and uh, thank you for that opportunity. Since that time, we received zoning board approval, and so we are here tonight, as as Mr. Breskin said, to seek approval from the planning board on this project. Um, because we previewed this in mid-July, I don't want to go over too much of the project's history, but Lakes Region Community Developers is proposing to complete the Harriman Hill development, which already includes, of course, phases one and two, which are 48 units of affordable rental housing. And phase three, as the site plan uh, shows, 
will be 30 units of additional affordable rental housing on the phase three site. And this is a change from the originally approved site plan for phase three, which was 20 units of affordable ownership housing. So in total, this plan will provide 10 additional units of affordable housing, 30 now rental versus the original 20, uh, in a mix of one, two, and three bedrooms, uh, which in total constitute the same 60 bedrooms that were approved, which is important from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, so I, before I turn it over for a more detailed uh, site plan review, I would just like to highlight a few things that haven't changed and a few approvals uh, we've already received from, from town staff and discussions we've had. First is to highlight the things regarding this new site plan uh, which haven't changed, and that is, importantly, that we're proposing a plan that does not change the previously approved site parameters. And in fact, we have a letter, I believe you have a copy of it, but just to highlight, uh, we did ask the Wolfboro Conservation Commission uh, to uh, give their perspective, and they have written that they have no concerns at all with this site plan, as the footprint of the development remains the same, and there will be no encroachment on the conservation easement boundary. This site plan also does not burden the sewer and water infrastructure of Wolfboro to a greater degree than had already been planned um, because the same 60 bedrooms remain uh, overall. And Rod Dempsey from the superintendent of Wolfboro Power, or Water and Sewer has written stating that he has no concerns after reviewing the current capacity of Harriman Hill and the planning that had been done to accommodate these units. And importantly, from an affordable housing perspective, this plan does not in any way change Lakes Region community developers' commitment to the requirement that a minim minimum of 50% of Harriman Hill units be devoted to low and very low income households. So we're here tonight seeking uh, planning board approval, which is key not only, of course, because it's necessary for the project to move forward, but we're also in the middle of trying to fund this project, and the one of the key uh, funding applications is due at the end of September. So the timing is very good that we, of course, uh, one of the things they want to see is that the entire community is beyond, behind this approval uh, with our application. So we're here seeking your approval tonight for completion of Harriman Hill Phase 3. Phases one and two, as the speakers throughout the ZBA process uh, highlighted, has been very successful. Lakes Region Community Developers was the developer and constructed those units and continues to manage those 48 units very successfully. Uh, tonight we have with us Kevin Leonard, is the principal engineer at North Point Engineering and leading the project engineering for this site. Uh, and Sal Stephen Hubbard, who's the real estate development director with Lakes Region Community Developers. So hopefully we can uh, go through the details and uh, be able to answer any questions that you might have. Good evening, I'm Kevin Leonard from North Point Engineering. I guess I wanted to start with the uh, exhibit there on the right. It just shows the, the parent tract of Harriman Hill, all, you know, all phases, and the green area is the land unit C, which is the, the area that uh, phase three is occurring in. It's um, 3.6 acres. Zoned VR, which is vis uh, village residential. As uh, Steve mentioned, the property is served by water and sewer. The water and sewer was stubbed to, to land unit C um, as part of the phase one and two work. So those stubs are already existing um, at the kind of the entrance of land unit C. We have 30 units, um, 60 bedrooms. We have six buildings, the rendering here. We've got the, the buildings identified as uh, five unit buildings, six of them. We've numbered them or, or labeled them A, B, kind of on the top of the page, and then C, D, E, and F, because you work down kind of right to left, uh, left to right, excuse me. We have six handicap units. Uh, four of those are one bedroom, one of those a two bedroom, and one at three bedroom. These are attached townhouses, which we submitted the, the architectural renderings of what the buildings were gonna look like. The uh, accessible units would be one story, um, that, which makes sense to make them keep them accessible. The two of the uh, 
buildings that have accessible units will have one, one bedroom units on the first floor and then one bedroom non-accessible units on the second floor, coupled with a townhouse on the end. So again, having the five units per building. We're proposing to have attached laundry rooms and utility rooms that are common to the buildings, so, so folks will um, go outside to, the to their laundry room on their building to do their laundry. We're proposing 40 parking spaces where 59 spaces, oh, I'm sorry, I got that reversed. 40 parking spaces are required, and we're proposing 59 parking spaces, nine of which would be handicapped. We have additional parking to accommodate um, guest parking, because we're having a 600 square foot clubhouse that we want to have accessible to the all phases of the, of, of the Harriman Hill development, and uh, also to accommodate for visitors to the site. Proposed roads are 22 feet wide, similar to the last approval. Uh, the proposed road will be permanently private access road with a 15 mile per hour speed limit. This application proposes the parking to be in front of the, the units with a vertical granite curb and sidewalks kind of looping around the perimeter of the whole project, creating a pedestrian kind of a friendly environment. We are proposing uh, a 20 foot wide gravel emergency access road, which you see in the brown on the lower uh, left of the development. That was a request of the fire chief. We have accommodated that request. The access drive uh, will have a gated access at the at the lower end of the, of the entrance at where phase intersects with phase one. Um, we're proposing a few four street lights kind of on the corners of, of, of the development, which will be dark sky compliant. And then we're proposing um, carriage lights kind of scattered around the perimeter of the, f the face of the building to provide more lighting for the sidewalk and the entries and, and the parking. If we're complementary uh, landscaping plan prepared by a landscape architect as part of the application. The dumpsters will be in an enclosure in the upper right hand corner of the development. And I wanted to point out that the in the redevelopment or the re re reworking of this of this of the land unit C development, we've actually been able to retain more trees than we were than we had in the previous 2020 approval because the development's a little bit tighter together, and so we're weaving some trees within land unit C, um, kind of furthering the buffer around the property. From there, I can get into the details of the plan, but I thought I'd see if there's any questions before I go to that. Uh, I have a question, which um, you mentioned this is 3.6 acres. Yeah. Um, sheet 2, C2 of the plans, Labels it as 3.82 acres. Is that? And I think everything else refers to it as 3.6 acres. I just wondered why there was a difference. the current land unit C, which is part of the application and, and labels land unit C as 3.6 acres. I'm not sure which plan you're looking at. Uh, C2. It's circled. There may be a typo. I'm... I think that's a typo. Okay. Any other questions before I continue on? I don't think so. Please continue. What's that? I don't think there are any questions. Please continue. Okay. You can pick up the microphone. Oh, that works. Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to walk through the plans. I'm going to skip. It's always a plan for that. Thank you. So this is land unit C before it was modified in 2020. 
This is WAN Unit C as we have it today that we're developing. This is the overview of, of the whole property. Again, WAN Unit C is up here in the, in the upper left corner. So this is the layout, basically the same as the colored version that we saw a moment ago. I want to point out there's a breakdown of the unit count here on the plans, which are, adds up to the 60 bedrooms we spoke about before. Here's sort of the detailed uh, site plan on the, broken into two sheets. So this is the north sheet. This is sheet C3. On this sheet, you can see that the specifics of the units, the striping, the parking, 22-foot aisle, parking spaces that are 19 by 9. We're showing snow storage on this plan. The enclosed dumpster is up here in the upper right. And I mentioned that the buildings are labeled A, B, C, D, E, and so on down the sheet. I wanted to point out that the, the community room is proposed right here, which is on kind of a, at the entry coming in. The existing uh, phase one is located right here, and phase three or two is over here. And the stubs for the utilities are all located right here, just off the pavement. So that's uh, water, sewer, and underground utilities. Sheet C5 is an overview of the grading plan. Uh, I should have mentioned that there's a wetland to the east um, over here, which we're staying away from and honoring the wetland buffer that is required by the ordinance. Um, generally, the site slopes kind of from the back to downhill towards this direction. The existing detention pond is located there. That was built in phase, as part of phase one. But remember that back when the whole development was, was developed, uh, proposed, it was planning for all phases. So that base was actually oversized to accommodate phase three to happen. So it was part of the original design and alteration terrain permit. It, was, it uh, had accommodation for basically the runoff to go to that direction, which is why we are proposing to plumb the drainage, sort of collecting it in a series of basins to a upper basin, new upper basin, and then outletting that upper basin over here into the existing lower basin. So it's like a two-stage stormwater detention system. So C C6 is basically a blow-up of, of that same detail, detail grading plan. Because of the topography of the, of the property, the buildings will be they'll have steps from one unit to the next because it's following the, basically you're climbing up the hill, coming to the crest, and then rolling back down the hill to get back to the intersection. So to keep, particularly to keep the handicap accessible units close to the proximity of the parking and, and drives, we're gradually stepping the buildings up as we come around the corner and then stepping them down as we come back around trying to keep, minimize steps to the extent possible. Uh, in the worst case, we have one step in, in, into a unit. So we're, we're working pretty hard not to have lots of steps in and out of the units. Here's the emergency access road down to the existing pavement down there on phase one. Um, you'll note that the grades coming into the development and off the back of the Emergency access road are a bit steeper, so we have uh, riprap slopes proposed on those grades. Sheet C8 is the uh, road ro roadway profile. It basically um, is coming up off the existing pavement, and then we have a series of 2% grades, um, basically to accommodate the handicap accessibility. We're trying to keep everything flat, nice and flat up around those units so that you're basically coming, parking, have gentle grades, because you're not allowed any more than 2% cross slope on a handicapped parking spot. So we're keeping everything nice and 2% flat. And then we have uh, sidewalk, sidewalk ramps into the accessible units. We do have a profile of the emergency access road, which will be gravel. Sheet C9 is the utilities plan. It mirrors kind of the, the 2020 approval. Um, there'll be a looped water system, eight-inch line. 
this is a low, pre low pressure sewer system already set up as part of Harriman Hill, which is sub down here. We'll be extending that force main up and around. And then each building will have a septic tank that will settle out solids and then a pump that will pump into the low pressure sewer system. So it's called a step system, septic tank, effluent pump. C10 is the landscaping plan. We've got a series of uh, tree plantings kind of around the perimeter and, and in between sort of the islands in the front of the property. And then we have detailed foundation plantings of each building showing up, up here in the upper right. This plan was prepared by Terrain, Terrain which is a landscape architectural company out of Hopkinton. We've got a comprehensive lighting plan, four lights, sort of higher street level lights, but downcast. Dark sky compliant, kind of at the inner, inner four corners to create some just general kind of neighborhood lighting. And then a series of uh, carriage lights kind of on the frontage of all buildings to have light kind of at the entries, but not as intense. Are, are those the ones on the po the one light out there, the ones by each, around the outside of the units? The, 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 the fixtures are shown here. So the, yeah. the taller lights are, the, are the, these four. Okay. And then the carriage lights are the other circles, which are much smaller. Okay. Yep. We have a comprehensive erosion control plan, uh, stabilized construction entrance, perimeter silt fence, stone check dams, um, erosion control mats, and then a comprehensive set of details, which I can, you know, covers all aspects of the proposed work: drainage, sewer, water erosion control, um, et cetera. I'd be happy to ask, answer any specific questions regarding those. Thanks. I guess before I, one other thing I should mention are there are four, uh, four waivers uh, submitted as part of the application. Um, we can tackle those when, when, when the time's appropriate. Any questions from anybody on the board? All right. So then I would, uh, I would put forth a motion to accept this application as complete. I think we need to act on the waivers. Ah, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. And can I ask Thank one you. question? Do you have a, an inspection and maintenance schedule for the uh, Stormwater structures? Absolutely. We, we have filed a, a, for a new alteration of terrain permit, and an inspection and maintenance manual is a requirement of, of, of that permit as well as your current stormwater regulations. So that was submitted as part of the application package. So the waivers I see are, as you said, the, the nitrogen reduction stormwater regulation. Uh, the groundwater recharge and the stormwater channel protection requirements. The, see, did the fourth one is on page 34 of the application because it was simple enough that I could write it. I didn't have a supplemental letter for it. And that's, um, we're seeking a waiver to not map all the wetlands in the entire property. We did remap the wetlands along, along on that wetland that's to the right uh, of the development. So those were remapped, but we're asking for a waiver not to remap everything all over the entire property, which was originally mapped uh, in 2008. And, and the logic behind that is that we're not doing work near those wetlands, so we, we, and they were previously mapped. So we didn't feel it was, it was critical to the proposal. Very good. Anybody have any questions on the waivers? So Tavis, is it appropriate here to uh, make a motion to grant the waivers, is that right? If the, if the board is satisfied, there could be a, a simple motion to uh, approve the waivers as requested and accept the application as complete thereupon. All right. Uh, I would put forth a motion to grant the four waivers as requested. Based on the submitted information. Based on the submitted evidence and accept the application as complete. <coughs> is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. We now open for public comment. Anybody would like to speak to this? Good, 
Good evening. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good evening. My name is Bonnie Medico. I'm chair of the board of directors for the Eastern Lakes Region Housing Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to talk in support of this project. Eastern Lakes um, is a nonprofit, 501c3. We've been uh, registered since May of 2005, and Harriman, Hills Pro Harriman Hill Project started in 2008. Some in, in, we built Harriman Hill 1 and 2 in partnership with Lakes Region Community Developers. They're also a nonprofit organization. Some of the information for the, uh, in regards to the current Harriman Hill residents and all of the data that I'm sharing about Harriman Hill was uh, given in effective as of June 1st. There are 16 one-bedroom units. Their rent ranges from $670 to $775. 24 two-bedroom units with rent range of $750 to $1,150 and eight three-bedroom units with a rent range of 915 to 1225. The one-bedroom units as of June 1st had 20 people waiting on a waiting list. The two-bedrooms had 16 people waiting for vacancies and the three-bedroom units had seven people, um, which is one of the reasons why the market study that Lakes Region has done indicated that there was a need for single, more single one bedroom units. Total households at the time of June 1st, uh, 47, there was one vacant apartment that was in transition. There are 20 single family homes, uh, and I'm sorry, 27 family homes and 20 single family homes. 30 children under the age of 18, 47 adults from 18 to 61, and 20 seniors, 62 and over. We also have two veterans living at Harriman Hill. 70% of the residents at Harriman Hill who receive income from employment work in Wolfboro. They work at various institutions such as Huggins Hospital, Brewster Academy, the Governor Wentworth Regional School District, and um, PSI Molded Plastic also other retail services, uh, restaurants, uh, other hospitality uh, it, uh, businesses. I've got, I've got a letter of support, so I'm trying to get this in in five minutes, sorry. Some of the data in regards to local real estate market. Uh, a local realtor, Marco Skelly, on, uh, we asked her for some in, uh, information in regards to the local real estate market. She's had 15 years as a local real estate agent here in Wolfboro. The last seven years, she's worked with Adam Dow at the Dow Realty at Keller Williams. They, are the, they have been ranked the number one real estate agency in the state of New Hampshire. And uh, her information, her research was done as of June 26. At that time, she was searching for actively listed single family and condominiums for sale in Wolfboro. By actively listed, that's an MLS term. They're not under contract. They're listed with, they're listed with um, MLS. Of the, of the homes and condos that she found, there were only 20 that were actively listed. The, uh, I'm sorry. According, uh, she gets to the, we have a median price, according to the New Hampshire Association of Realtors, the median price for a single family home in Carroll County is $436,250. Five years ago, it was $250,000. As of June 26th, there were only three homes of the 20 that were listed in Wolfboro that were under $500,000 for sale. <clears throat> At the same time that she was doing the research on the home, she was also doing research on rentals in, in the Wolfboro area that were listed online. At that time, she could only find three rentals advertised online, vacant, and the cheapest rental that, was, that she could find was a two-bedroom, one-and-a-half bath apartment with a rent of $1,600 a month plus utilities. <clears throat> and I'm sure you're aware that the Lakes Region Planning Commission has also put out the Lakes Region 2023 Lakes Region Housing Assessment, Housing Needs Assessment. 
there's one table within that uh, report, and it's a pretty extensive report, that really drove home, at least uh, in my reading, drove home the challenge of housing, affordable housing for the workforce in the Lakes Region area. They listed, and they covered 31 towns in the study, they listed 15 occupations. Of the 15 occupations, as far as what they, the, only the top five earning occupations in a single income household could afford to pay the median rent of a, a rental in the area without being cost burden. And cost burden is having um, housing expense, whether it's mortgage or rent, uh, utilities and tax insurance for, more, for home, of uh, more than 30% of the, the in income coming into the house. Of that, those five uh, occupations that could afford to rent are, en are engineers, registered nurses, police, electricians, and tractor trailer truck drivers. <clears throat> no single income household within the 15 occupations that they listed could afford to purchase a median priced home. I'm sorry, so those were rentals the, without being cost burdened. If there are two earners, within the household, the top two earning occupations, engineers and, and registered nurses, could afford to purchase a, a median priced home within the area without being cost burden. Even with two earners within, a media, within the household, the other 13 occupations cannot afford to purchase a median priced home within our area without being cost burden. Some of those 13 occupations that are priced out of the, the median market are office workers, construction workers, home health care employers, employees, retail salespersons, cashiers, childcare workers, waiters and waitresses, a number of the service jobs that we all rely upon. Vacancy rate within a, a balanced market should be 5%. New Hampshire Housing, so New Hampshire Housing put out their 2023 housing needs assessment. And New Hampshire Housing determined that the state of New Hampshire has a 0.5% rental vacancy within the state, which makes it almost impossible for people that are in need of a rental to find one that they can afford. Rent, house, affordable housing is a critical component for the stability and economic uh, viability of any community. And being able to live within the community that you work has become almost a privilege now as opposed to a, a given right. <clears throat> the scarcity of the affordable housing and long-term rentals in the area contributes to the challenges local businesses experience with hiring and retaining employees it forces residents to leave the area in search of affordable housing for their families. It makes re ex it extremely difficult for local school graduates and senior citizens on fixed incomes to stay within, to remain within the area in which they've lived. The addition of affordable rental, co uh, rental units at Harriman Hill 3 would fill a significant need in our area in order that's faced by many employees, families, and seniors in, the, in our area. I've been asked to share um, with the board some points of support that the Wolfboro Chamber of Commerce would like to have added into the record. This is from Mary DeVries. As far as Harriman Hill 3 is concerned, the Chamber feels they recommend all involved for developing this new strategy, rentals versus the single uh, home ownership, to continue to create more housing opportunities. The need for year-round housing rentals in many ways has not changed since 2005, <clears throat> when the then newly formed Eastern Lakes Region Housing Coalition formally addressed the need in Wolfboro and surrounding communities. Wolfboro continues to hear just how few rentals are available and the challenge local employers have in keeping the staff that is needed to provide quality services in a timely manner. Keeping customers satisfied, satisfied encourages them to return, which then benefits the entire local economy. One of the biggest 
changes since 2005 that is that today 48 rental units within Harriman Hill exist within Harriman Hill. However, it's our understanding that there is a waiting list uh, which I referenced and on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, Ms. DeVries asks you to please um, respond favorably to the Harriman Hill 3 project. So in closing, I'd like to share with the board um, letters of support that we've received from Huggins Hospital, Taylor Community, and also uh, a resident, Edie Damaris, who was one of the original um, directors of the Housing Coalition, in support of Harriman Hill 3. I thank you for your time. Sorry if I went over uh, trying fine. to cover <laughs> a lot. Um, and I appreciate your support and your time with Harriman Hill 3. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just share these. Yeah, if you could leave them. We have the letters, all the letters that you mentioned, except the one from uh, Mary, I believe. Yep. From Mary DeVries. Yeah. Hello, good evening. My name is Carrie Duran, and I am a mom of three amazing young ladies. I have 17-year-old twin girls who are going to be seniors this year. I have a busy year ahead. And I have a 12-year-old daughter who was born with a developmental disability of Down syndrome. And she's 12, and she's going into middle school. She's very excited. And we are... In November will be nine years that we have been residents of Harriman Hill. I'm a single mom raising my girls and in a community that I grew up in. I graduated from Kingswood myself and I wanted to raise my girls here and have the opportunity for them to have the wonderful um, childhood that I experienced. So being at Harriman Hill has been wonderful for our family. We, uh, my girls can play outside safely, ride their bikes, spread when they were little, spread their Barbies out and play um, out in the front yard. It's a safe, safe place to raise our kids. And it's also a wonderful place to become close with your neighbors. I have several neighbors now that I consider members of my family. And I just wanted to put a, a face to uh, some of the residents as one of the family members at Harriman Hill so that you can know how much we love it there and appreciate it, appreciate the opportunity to live in a town that we love and raise our children. And I am also a board member of Lakes Region Community Developers. I'm currently the um, vice chair of the board. And on both of those counts as a resident, I fully support um, and ask you to fully support the Harriman Hill 3 project um, because we need to have more safe, uh, healthy, beautiful homes for our families to live in Wolfboro so that they can stay in Wolfboro, go to school, and um, work in Wolfboro. So I thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for all of the hard work that's gone into bringing this project forward. And I look forward to seeing those construction vehicles very soon in my neighborhood. Thank you so much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Seeing nobody else, we'll close the public comment section. Any comments from the planning board? I have Julie? one comment. I am very happy to see this picture in front of me that looks like a neighborhood with all the little townhouses all staggered nicely. It doesn't look like one big warehouse. Thank you. <laughs> If there's no further comment, Tavis, do you have any recommendations for condition of approval? I do have some recommendations. Uh, the first is that the V1, the following plans, is amended today to this approval or incorporated into the approval. Those are the materials that you've received. That's inclusive through this evening through July, as received July 12, 23 through this evening. Uh, applicant shall be responsible for payment of all recording fees for the notice of decision. Uh, applicant shall coordinate with staff relative to section 17530 to establish a surety as required prior to commencement of site work. 
That's dealing with the 110% surety for stormwater and landscaping that would be kept in a separate fund. Um, Number four, applicant shall provide a materials list for the exterior finishes of the structure. They provided elevations, but no finishes, and it's just a matter of making sure the list lines up with the regulations. Uh, and if there's any question, they would be brought back to the board prior to issuance of a building permit. Uh, number five, all documentation submitted in the application package by the applicant and any requirements imposed by other agencies are part of this approval unless otherwise updated, revised, clarified in some manner, or superseded in full or in part. In the case of conflicting information between documents, the most recent documentation and this notice herein shall be generally be determining. Would it also be appropriate to require that the uh, alteration of terrain permit be received prior to issuing a building permit? I believe that's already in process or issued, but that would happen anyway, yes. Okay, very good. I think that should be a condition of approval. Okay. I don't think we can hold this up uh, uh, based on another entity's uh, permit, but it should be a condition of the approval. And I have a couple of other comments. Uh, the plans, I believe, were received on July 11th, 2023, not July 12th. Uh, the reference in the plan and review to section 175.30, it should be section 173.30, and I think we should spell out uh, what the um, security is for. The uh, review uh, that talks about stormwater and landscaping, I think we also should include the roads in that. Anything else, Roger? That's that it? it. Okay. Tavers, are you checking on that section? I, I don't like 173.30, no. Okay. You don't like 173.30? That's inspection. 173.30 deals with inspections during installation. Okay. Well, in the... In your review, you mentioned 173.30 under security, and then 175 is the zoning ordinance, and I think we're talking about the security provisions of we're the site review regulations. Correct. We're talking about the security under the site review uh, regulations with respect to stormwater and landscaping. Uh, staff is not recommending anything with respect to the road as it's a private road and it's not going to be a town road. Uh, if the board wants to add review of the road, that is perfectly within your purview. All right, but I expect we should have the correct uh, ordinance referenced for the surety if it's not 175.30. It's not 175.30, but I think we should have security for the roads when somebody comes in with a subdivision where the, roads, the road is not going to be a public road immediately, whether it is or not, we require uh, a performance security for the construction. We, we could do a surety for the road, but not a bond for its construction. Yes, because it's not going to be public infrastructure. There just should be security for its construction. I mean, the town's been burned on a lot of subdivision roads that were not quite what they were supposed to be. So not I would, that I'm questioning what's going to be done here. I mean, I think they've correct. submitted a very good, complete application. So I would suggest that the appropriate reference is 173.16. Surety required semicolon amount, semicolon term. The applicant shall post an acceptable financial surety prior to final sign-off of the plan approved by the planning board. The financial surety shall be in the amount sufficient to ensure completion of all roads, public or private. Well, it says roads, public or private, drainage, comma, and landscaping, period. So 173.16 for landscaping, drainage, and roads. Yep. Yeah, I think that's correct. So uh, then I expect we should reword the third condition to applicants shall coordinate with staff relative to 173.16 and establish a surety as required prior to commencement of site work. Same as what you said before, but yeah. with the correct reference. Correct. I, I would like to specify roads, landscaping, and... To, to establish surety for roads, landscaping, yeah. and drainage yeah. as required prior to commencement. So, 
Condition three would read, applicants shall coordinate with staff relative to section 173.16 and establish surety for roads, drainage, and landscaping as required prior to commencement of work. I believe that's correct. Any other comments? And they're also going to include uh, receipt of the alteration of terrain permit. And six would be... That would be the sixth condition. AOT should be, copy of approved AOT should be submitted to town prior to issuance of a building permit. Yes. All right. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve this application along with the conditions as described. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. 45. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. You're welcome. The uh, uh, next item on the agenda, uh, Brewster Academy, 80 Academic Drive, tax map in lot 218-150, case 2023-13. Uh, this is for a site plan uh, review for a permanent ice rink at Brewster. Uh, so if the, uh, everyone will just follow the directions given to Harriman Hill, that would be great. <laughs> Good evening, every <clears throat> change the mic every time here. Hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andy Smith. I'm senior project manager at DSK Doing Schmid Kearns. Um, pleased to present the Brewster Academy Ice Rink Improvements Project. Uh, these plans I'm hoping you have in front of you, or I have extra copies if you need them. Uh, this ice rink uh, was previously approved under a temporary basis about a year ago, so it's actually been installed. Uh, what we're here today uh, seeking approval for is uh, really for it to be a um, up in a more permanent fashion. So. Um, Previous approval was for a temporary basis, uh, for it to be removed and put back up again. We're here for it to um, to stay up in a more uh, permanent way all the year, um, uh, throughout the year. Um, some of the um, other items that we're requesting are um, that uh, lights can be on for events within um, non-quiet hours. Uh, we're seeking approval for uh, public events and games, only a handful throughout the year, so not not too disruptive, um, and um, that, yes, that we have the rink up permanently. The um, plans that we've submitted primarily focus on stormwater improvements, so um, we're trying to make the areas around the ice rink uh, more habitable and um, it, a lot cleaner, so dealing with stormwater issues and also the um, uh, in adding in sidewalks and um, bituminous concrete or asphalt around the rink so that spectators can view the games in a more comfortable way and they're not standing in mud or on temporary mats. So I don't know if you want to go through the site plan on CU-201. We have a plan showing the um, proposed improvements. We have, um, we're showing the ice rink as it's currently installed. And uh, what we're proposing to improve is adding in swales, drainage swales on either side of the ice rink uh, that will carry stormwater away and downhill. And also you can see in the dark gray is the asphalt going around the rink to provide um, you know, a more clean and habitable area for spectators to stand. So that, again, they're not standing in um, grass or mud. And um, you can see on the right side of the plan is the existing parking lot that we're proposing will be used for events in addition to other parking on campus, uh, both at the Goodwin lot and other areas uh, that are already included within uh, Brewster's overall parking counts. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, you'll see also that we ha we're showing asphalt uh, going to the Zamboni shed, which was previously approved under a separate building permit. Um, so we'd like to improve that pathway so that the Zamboni is not, again, going through gravel. It's going on a nice paved uh, path to the ice rink. We have uh, all the grades and catch basins included on here, as well as uh, areas for uh, ice to be dumped from the Zamboni. And um, hopefully, you know, keeping that away from uh, adjacent residents. Uh, all of the lighting was previously approved under the previous uh, temporary approval. So uh, all the light fixtures, dark sky compliant, they are installed right now. And um, so that the photometrics and the cut sheets uh, were submitted as part of that. I believe we also submitted it as part of this approval as well. So no new lighting is being No added. new lighting is being proposed. No, just what is there right now. Okay, uh, the hours of operation, could you go over that again, please? Sure. So I think the um, overall goal is to keep it within the uh, non-quiet uh, hours. So that's um, the hours set forth in the, in the zoning bylaws. So it wouldn't be after 10 p.m. Uh, most, most of the events would be during the daytime. And on weekends, I believe. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they're going to be they're going to be in use until 10 p.m. Is, is uh, it? the games are not? I don't think they're intended to be past uh, the afternoon hours. So the daytime hours primarily. Okay. Then, so it's mainly the games are are during the uh, daytime. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we're only talking about doing a couple of winter classics a year. We'll still maintain our relationship with the Pop Whalen Arena and have most of our games are going to be there. But what we, yep, what we noticed was it's nice to have a couple of events. Who are you, Peter? Oh, Peter Gilligan, uh, <laughs> Chief Operating Officer of Bristol yeah. Academy. Thank you, Tavis. Um, yeah, the, the idea was to sort of just keep with the normal standard non-quiet hours that we already have established with, with Wolfboro, you know, so we wouldn't be keeping the lights or using the rink outside of that window. And I want to say it's 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., but generally all of our stuff is is done. Uh, our students are, have to be checked into their dorms at that time, so we most of our things will finish up in the afternoon. So so you'll have recreational skating or yeah, whatever? Yeah, we'll like an open skate. You know, we, we were talking with Linda Murray just the other day about using it again for first night, you know, things like that. We just mm -hmm. want to make sure that we keep it within the bounds that you guys already have in the zoning ordinance. Okay, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, can yeah. somebody speak to the noise issue? Yep, so the we, compressors. unfortunately we weren't able to put that into the package because it came to us after we were able to be submitted to you. So what we have today is um, what our plan to do is we have been investigating and looking into uh, sound dampening uh, panels that go around, uh, the, go around the condenser. And what we did is we had to contact the company Everything Ice where we purchased the equipment from and he worked on a plan and gave us this right here and so we currently have that under process to do. Like, unfortunately, we just didn't have that information before we submitted so we wanted to bring that to you today and just kind of show you uh, what that was and if it's okay with you guys, I can hand them to you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. sound <laughs> dampening. Okay, so how much uh, this will, uh, are they saying that this will decrease the noise? Yeah, it's, I think it, what the uh, manufacturer has told us is that is what they use in these instances where you want to have the sound dampened. Um, and I can't give you an exact, you know, quantify it, but it would be less noise than it currently is. Okay, are there going to be seats for spectators? No, we're just planning the same sort of way we had it last year where people watch the practices, just standing room um, around the rink. Um, you know, not really a big spectator type location. Like I said, we're only get, planning on doing a few games of uh, winter classics. Tavis? I, I've received a number of phone calls when the question of games or no games came up. When you hear games, you hear a couple of winter classics and things like that. This is not for regular interscholastic play by any means, correct? No, our, in, in, our interscholastic play we played at away, away games and at the Pop Whalen Arena. 
Hi, I'm Susan Harrington. I'm Chief Financial Officer at Brewster Academy. Yeah, as Pete mentioned, the majority of our games will be played at the POP. However, the Winter Classic games technically are interscholastic games. We're looking to host one or two for each boys and girls varsity <laughs> hockey teams. Those would be on a Saturday during the afternoon, not in the evening. Can you tell us how many Saturdays you might think during the year? We're thinking two games for the boys team and two games for the girls team. Um, but we haven't set that schedule yet, so somewhere in that neighborhood. And how many days? The majority days? of games will be at the pop and that at opposing schools. So you've just mentioned about four games, but how many days would that occur over? A total of either two or four. Okay. Again, the schedule hasn't been set yet, but two or four. Um, parking, we are intending for uh, away teams to park at Anderson Hall with overflow in existing parking lots at Brewster Academy not on Green Street, Goodwin parking lot, and our Estabrook parking lot. So we have a plan in place for any overflow parking that might result that doesn't fit in the Anderson, uh, Anderson Hall parking lot. So games at most would be four Saturdays during the day? Yep, at the most. correct. Okay. Uh, you mentioned... Um, what is the season which this is going to be in operation? And the other thing is that uh, the soundproofing uh, might be an eyesore if seen from Main Street. Is that going to be some issue which uh, is, is a problem? I'll answer the first question and I'll let Pete answer the second question. The season runs from uh, Halloween until the end of February. Uh, students depart from March break at the beginning of March, at which point our season is over. And Peter, the location for the current chillers is, is below grade, so you can't see them from the road, the parking lot, or anywhere else. It's, it's below grade. So you could see it from internally on our campus, but that would be the only location somebody could see it. So I wouldn't think it would be an eyesore. I have a question. It's not, it's not necessarily below grade, what, what, but it's below the grade of the main street level. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's why we bring okay. it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Julie. Question on that surround that you handed out the picture to. Is that three-sided or four-sided? I can't it, tell. It's four-sided. Okay. Yep. That's just the best view that he, of the pictures that he sent us, so we thought that would capture exactly what and we were And I have one do. more question. Back up a little bit more. The lights. Are the lights going to be on 24-7, or will they be on only when people are on the ice? No, just like last year where we had them running, they are on timers, and they, they shut down. We can either shut them down when we're done using it, which was usually around 6 or 7 p.m., or uh, they have an automatic timer to put them, put them off at, at 10. And they're all dark sky compliant, as Andy told you. Um, for the surround that you have, uh, what, what kind of foundation is it, and is it tight to the ground? This, the, 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 the ice rink is still a temporary, uh, a portable system, so it's not tied to the ground in any way. We may look to put a couple of um, the pieces of concrete in to shore up some areas, but right now it is just, it is just right on the ground. No, I'm sorry. I meant for the surround, uh, the sound deadening surround that you have oh, around oh, the children. It has. It, I'm sorry. It's on. It's on uh, concrete uh, pillars. So on uh, like solder tubes. Okay. Yep. You mentioned something about it being open to the public. Yeah, a couple times what we did is we, we, working with the town, we opened up a free skate where people, if they had a waiver and they had a mm -hmm. helmet, they were able to come and skate on, on the rink. And it was a couple of nights, and it was a nice, it was a nice moment for everybody. Uh, like I said, we did it at first night, and I thought that was very well received. Uh, what, um, any changes in the storm water? I think uh, drainage. Yeah, that's that's what we came. You know, last time we were here, we really wanted to make sure that we um, came back with a full mm -hmm. stormwater stormwater management plan. And we have Joanne here from RFS Engineering to be able to speak to any questions you might have. So um, a lot of the time frame in getting this ready was making sure that we had that stormwater management plan correct. Okay. Uh, we know how much that means to many members of the board and to the town. So we wanted to make sure we did that. Okay, could could we hear from her? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question on the stormwater. Under our regulations, the requirements for the removal of total suspended solids, phosphorus, and nitrogen, and when I read the report, I didn't find anything addressing them. My name's Joanne Coppinger. I'm with RFS Engineering, and I did the stormwater design for the project. Um, if it's not explicitly stated, I can provide a, um, a statement to the effect that it does address uh, nitrogen and phosphorus um, remediation. Yeah, I, I, yeah, we can't hear you. 
speak directly into it. Okay, can you hear me now? Much yes, better. We can. If you need you. Um, it, me to um, prepare a statement regarding nitrogen and phosphorus control remediation, I can, I can do that it's, if it's not explicitly stated anywhere in the stormwater runoff, uh, stormwater drainage report. Would you like me to just give you an overview of what the, okay. Uh, yes, if you would. I, I, is everyone familiar with the site? Um, yes. So there's a parking lot for Anderson Hall immediately adjacent to the rink. And this parking lot is sloped right toward the rink. So we, we, we've created a shallow swathed pail, swale, to collect the runoff from the parking lot, which tends to be, you know, more on the dirty side, and, and route it around the site. So because that's off site, and but it's headed toward our site, and we've routed it to where it currently goes. So that is getting rerouted around the rink. And then the rink itself will shed water to the sides. And it is elevated, if you've been out there, it's kind of on a mound because they had to make it level and bring in some fill. So beneath that fill, when the water sheds off the rink, it, there are a number of catch basins, and it will direct the water coming off the rink and the paved surfaces that we're proposing around the rink um, below ground in that mounded area right adjacent to the rink where it will go into a perforated 24-inch pipe um, with a lot of stone all around it, which will allow it to seep back into the ground. And then the overflow from that will go into um, grass swales on either side and be directed, um, you know, away toward the, um, what is the gymnasium there? Smith Center. Um, so in, into a, an existing grass swale there. I don't know if that is... Um, well, I, I'd also point out to the board that when this came before, it was generally determined that the stormwater regulations didn't apply to the ice rink as it was only in place when, or originally, only in place when the ground was frozen. Uh, but there were some questions raised about what was coming with the runoff from the parking lot, what was the long-term solution because there was some site grading and there were some other things. So I think that was what these what the applicant took this time to come up with. This is how we're addressing the parking lot. Um, I believe Laura can come up with the explanation of um, the additional runoff from the proposed paved areas that are coming with this and um, the runoff capacities. Basically what they did was they redesigned to go around the rink and still incorporate everything that was already on site to address stormwater. <coughs> effectively to show that the stormwater compliance wasn't a requirement of this review. That's how I looked at the review or the presentation this time. Can I ask? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. How many gallons of water do you need to make an ice rink? Um, that's not in my purview. <laughs> no, that's okay. I it's it's 20,000 gallons. So is, eventually all of that is going to go into this drain as well? How do you, how do you get rid of the water that's in the ice rink once, once we have summer? <laughs> What's that? I, I assume it will melt slowly and um, go into the, the system that I've, I've designed. Okay, you assume? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Are you prepared for the 20,000 gallons? I mean, is the system prepared for the 20,000 gallons? An another way to address the question might be, how does 20,000 gallons of ice rink compared to an equal amount of area covered with annual snowfall? Well, could you rephrase, could, could you repeat that? If you were to take the area of an ice rink and fill it with Wolfboro's annual snowfall, how does that compare to the 20,000 gallons of water? Well, I can't answer that right off the top of my head, but I could certainly look into it for you. Go ahead. 
Jane, I'd also speak to that we, it, it, we did it last year without having this very detailed and, and extensive stormwater management. 20,000 gallons of water isn't that much water, considering the size of it, it's 200 by 85, and it's water that would have already been there with a, a heavy snowpack that's now not there. Um, I guess, you know, we could say that it's similar to what it would be if there was just snow on an open field. You know. Did you notice any issues associated with that melting last year? Um, we didn't. There wasn't any extra in any of our swales. Um, e even though we weren't able to put grass down, we didn't have a lot of degradation of the sides, but that's why we want to make sure we add, add grass, uh, full grass on everything so it keeps everything tight for the, for the years to come. One, one of the things that Jason, the code officer, and I paid attention to, because you may recall the last approval was October to March and everything was to be up at that time. So about the time we started sending Peter the nasty letter say, hey, the rink is still up, what's going on? We started the process of compliance which resulted in this application. Uh, we did a number of site visits uh, with or without alerting Brewster to do anything ahead of time. And I could find no rivulets, you know, canyons, uh, incisions, uh, no evidence of any runoff that was atypical for anywhere else on the property. Uh, Peter, helps. Peter, could you let me know what do you do with the accumulated snow during the winter season when you, I assume you have to remove it somehow from the ice rink to be able to use the ice rink? Yep. And where is that placed and how is it disposed of? Yep. If you look on the plants, we have a location. Is, it, is this circle, the, the red circle on their plants? So the red circle that's on the north side of the plants, that's the location where we have, uh, oh, you made it red. Well, on the north side of the plants, it's one location where we put all the snow that comes off of the rink. And it goes right into where our, where, as Joanne said, our normal channel of stormwater management. So the same area that would take all of the water that normally came off that field, now we have it just go right there and it goes off. And on the opposite side is where we put um, the shavings from the Zamboni machine. So all downhill on our property and continues into our swales. Thank you. Yep. I have a related question. Looks like Zamboni is going to have a new shed. No, nope, the, sh the shed was approved uh, last year um, on a different, it's on a different lot that we have on, a pro on our property. It's already it there. Was. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That so, was how we got, you know, just it was easier to do that for us. It was closer to power and water. And then it was, a, 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 like we said, a second application as a building permit. Julie, I believe the only changes are going to uh, pave the path between the shed and the ice rink. Oh, right. I was just saying yeah. the, other, the other plans didn't have a shed on it. And I remember last year asking about it. Mm -hmm. But it's a different piece yeah, of the, property. The concern last year was that the Zamboni shed was, the pr proposed Zamboni shed may or may not be too close to the property line. So they resolved it by moving it completely opposite side of the property line. Okay, and uh, Tavis, in your, your comment, you said that uh, landscaping, uh, you didn't have any concerns about landscaping. What, what landscaping are you doing? We're adding grass, uh, so on all of the slopes that go away yeah, from the... the reason I said I wasn't grass. concerned with landscaping is our regulations typically require landscaping if you're screening something or adding parking. Uh, the board didn't seem to have any concerns with the ice rink being up last time, uh, so I didn't uh, feel the need for a uh, landscape Okay, well, plant. that was temporary. Um, they, would you consider putting some sort of landscaping in front of the rink as it faces... Uh, South Main Street. I think it would look a little better. I think the tough part of that is where we, that's where we have designed the asphalt swale that that takes the runoff from the from the yeah. uh, parking lot. Um, I mean, uh, certainly, I think we'd consider adding landscape around it. I don't know if there would be anything that would be the size that you would th be thinking about, but you know, and I don't have any particular size in mind. It just seems like you know, looking at it, you know, looking at the rink, if you could do something to improve the area. I know that's not within our zoning regulations. I think, you know, like anything, Kathy, when we get the, <laughs> now that we're, we want to make this a, something that is a, a more permanent fixture on our campus, yeah. as we do with any of our, our projects, we'll add landscaping to enhance the, the look and the, and, and the, the usability of it, uh, of the location. So certainly I could see that coming yeah. in the future. Okay. It might yeah. even fit between, I call it the tree lawn. Mm. Might fit out by the street. It's just something from the street view that yeah, could be too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And any other questions? Uh, no, and no waivers were. Uh, they they didn't ask for any waivers. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll make a motion to accept this application as complete. I'll second it. 
Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, can now we'll open the public hearing on uh, this ice skating rink at Brewster. Anyone who wants to comment on it? Thanks, my name is Dennis Schauer, 209 South Main Street. It's also known as Topside's Bed and Breakfast. So this is uh, not directly across from us, but it's, it, it's triangulated over to the side. And when we were approached a year ago, it was gonna be a temporary kind of a thing, and I guess it is, but it's a, a, a pretty disturbing temporary facility. It looks horrible. Uh, it is noisy. It's lighted, 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 um, and it is 10 o'clock roughly. There's a lot of banging that goes on. The glass, the puck hits the glass. I would say that from a neighbor standpoint, it's not a very friendly project. Um, for the city, it may be good, and it's certainly good for Brewster. And we're not trying to be a bad neighbor. I think we have tried to be a good neighbor. Um, We've worked hard on our landscaping to privatize our area from, from the Brewster side of things. When we bought it, it was a church. Uh, no longer is, obviously. Um, there's a, a several issues, I would say. One of them is snow. That has been a serious pet peeve of mine. Uh, when these guys talk about making light of snow, they've got a very closed situation there. Where are they gonna push the snow? They used to push it into that empty lot. It's no longer an empty lot. Students park their cars diagonally. So where does the snow go? I was appalled last winter at how much snow they pushed onto all the neighbor's lots. It was really appalling. Um, my arbovitis have suffered some pretty good damage. I've asked them a number of times if they could uh, not do that. In fact, when Brewster uh, asked for permission for the addition to the, the uh, Anderson Hall, they assured me that uh, they would no longer push snow to the side. They'd run it down the, the length of it. That never happened. I've had to talk to the, the actual operator a couple of times. He said, oh, I didn't know. Um, nothing changed, really. But uh, I would say, you need to take a serious look at some of these things that have been brought up. Landscaping is, is, a, is a serious one. It's, it's an eyesore the way it is now. It's a detriment to their property and everybody else's. So can it be made better? Sure it can. But they need to think about the landscaping and how it affects all the neighbors, not, not just Main Street. There are real people that live next door. And I don't think that should be forgotten. Probably forgetting a thing or two, but can yeah. Can I just ask you, um, have you spoken with other neighbors? I mean, you're, you, I don't know if you, oh, okay. Are there others here? Okay. I just wondered, I'm sort of assuming this is a general feeling, like on, on maybe on Green Street or? I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm just wondering if, um, if you're speaking for a lot of the neighbors, that's all. I'm talking about the people down Green Street. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that the people that go down Main Street, they, they don't see it. No, I, that's what I was wondering about yeah. Green Street, if they yeah. were kind of, okay. Yeah, oh, I mean, right. you that's know, I, what does landscaping mean? I think they need to shroud the thing in if they're going to keep make it a semi-permanent situation in some fashion. Um, yeah. You know, I don't deny that it's good for them. I mean, it, it is. Um, and we have a lot of people, well, not a lot, but we have several parents that that are enthusiastic about hockey. I get it. But I don't want it to be at our expense. Um, we're just small potatoes compared to them. We're just asking for some consideration. In the snow thing, I'm, I'm gonna get serious about that if this doesn't change, I'm telling you. I'm gonna, come, I'm gonna visit your offices more, more frequently. But thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Peter Batchelder. I live on 10 Green Street. So, the first thing, we got a taste of what the 
uh, ice rink is going to, the effects of the ice rink. And it really, really stinks. It's loud. The plane of the practices, and I don't even know if they had a game, probably not, but it's like a firecracker every time a puck hits the back of the rink walls. So have 20 players out there practicing, playing, having fun. You can hear them too. It's, at, it's in winter, so there's no trees. The sound carries, so I'm across the street. I have a view of the rink about 20%. So I can see about 20% of the rink from 10 Green Street, and the lighting shines and there isn't many lights there, but, but it's enough. It's lit up quite nicely. Uh, the light definitely shines right into our kitchen. So it's pretty bright. So we have the sound issue. We have the light issue. Uh, other people will talk about, you know, about other issues related to that. I think, generally, my opinion is it's not a bad spot to put an ice rink, but it's a horrible spot to put an ice rink. Can I say that? Because it's so close to the houses that are my neighbors, it's right there. It's like the Boston Garden in your backyard. Now, it's kind of cool for the first couple times they were practicing, it's kind of cool because the lights are on and they're playing hockey and they're all excited and you're watching it. And then it sets in that this is a poor location for the residents of Green Street. It can't get any worse, both noise, lighting, and just the proximity for our neighbors that I went over to their house at night and said, well, I'll check it out, you know, from your backyard. And it's like you're like five rows up from the Boston Garden. It's a great location. And so, but I can't even imagine seeing uh, a game with all the activity, even if there's minimal people coming from other locations, parking there, and the, the, the uh, yelling and screaming, uh, hollering for their team and hollering for the other person's team, it would be a fiasco. It's so close to Green Street. So why, why they put it there when we heard it was temporary, we were like, well, it's temporary. They didn't talk to me. I'm on the cross the street, so I'm not in a butter. So they're not going to talk to me. I get that. I didn't get any notifications or anything, and they didn't come visit me. That's fine. But it still greatly affects the whole Green Street rule, village rule character. And it basically is a horrible place to put it. Now, are they going to move it? Probably not. So I would make a suggestion that they move it away from Green Street, away, like go like 50 feet into your campus, into their campus. Don't leave it where it's at. We're, what we thought it was a tent, right? It's just this temporary structure that we're going to take up, we're going to take up every year. You won't even see it. You'll see a mound of dirt. That was our impression anyways. That was my impression and from the neighbors talking to them. That was not what they left. They left that thing that Denny had said from topside, and it looks horrible, it's just sticking there right, right out in the open like that. So if, if, if they're gonna keep it there, if they're gonna keep it there, and you're gonna say, yep, you can keep it where it is, then I would suggest that some major changes have to happen related to a fence, some kind of fence or sound system to, to stop that noise from echoing all the pucks hitting, the practices, the yelling, the screaming, and then lighting. Lighting's gonna be key because if I lived right in where Al Pierce lives in 11, which is right on the brink center, you, you have to close every curtain. 
you have to you you can't you can't sleep at night kind of a, it's so bright and i would imagine that it's only going to get brighter because i would say that it has to be lit up more when you're talking about traffic and 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 people parking and just the safety and walkways and all that so there's so we have a other, one other issue is just the whole sound thing right so the pa system this thing are they going to have any music is anyone going to do a kind of um, play by play and and this may not be the first year the second year but in five years what's their five-year plan for that space because that's not that's inadequate if they're going to have a hockey a professional kind of good quality uh, prep school hockey uh, team and they get good and they really put some money to it that thing's going to get hot and then everyone's going to be coming to this place that they call Brewster uh, Hockey, and they're going to be like their basketball, really, really good. They, they might do that. And then what happens to that backyard for all the Green Street people that are abutting that property? Uh, so noise, games, PA system. Uh, there is a compressor noise that I heard that they're going to put a, a concrete structure around it because now the compressors are just going off that keep the, I don't know exactly what they do, but I'm sure they're related to the, the ice keeping it cold. We've got walking traffic, uh, any uses for off season. Are there, could there be? Maybe, I don't know, maybe. And then you guys mentioned uh, seating. I would imagine that over time, they're gonna have to have some seating. I've walked around that thing. You don't get a good view, you, you know, one deep. You, you, you're gonna wanna see the game. And there's no way you're gonna want people next to that glass. You're, you're just not. It's not safe to be that close. You know, you're not in the penalty box, you know? <laughs> it's not that safe. So they're gonna have to have some seating, keeping the, the people away, even rival uh, probably hockey teams. So they're gonna have to have some kind of uh, strategy, fencing, uh, coming out of South, coming out of Brewster into South Main Street, uh, a different kind of parking scheme maybe. But there's a lot, there's a lot to think about related to this structure, this ice rink, because right now it is horrible. It is the worst location that you could possibly put on on a school grounds and just right in your face with the residents of Green Street. So, thank you. Okay, uh, thank, you. thank you. Hi everybody, my name's Ed Hines. I live at 22 Green Street. Um, my wife and I are right across the street from the generator that keeps the cooling system cold. Um, even with our windows closed at night, that's all we can hear. Amongst the, the pucks flying and, you know, you get that. Um, it has increased the traffic on our street and the Brewster employees and their guests are not respectful of the speed limit. It's been an ongoing since I moved in there 14 years ago. So that is a big issue with adding traffic to the street. Um, the other thing is, as Peter and both Dennis said, this was supposed to be temporary. That shouldn't even be still up. Winter's long gone. So we shouldn't even be here addressing this. It shouldn't even be up. Um, so other than the noise, and I, I mean, it, it looks terrible. Um, you know, that's really all I have to say about it is, um, there's got to be a, a better location for it, or um, and, and again, it, it's it was supposed to be temporary. It's still there. Why should would we believe they're going to do what they say they're going to do this time? So that's all I got. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Nancy Hirschberg, and I'm a, I live on 40 Clark Road, so I'm the next road over. Um, 
let's see. Um, I guess I'll just start by saying my daughter went to Brewster. Uh, I will always be eternally in indebted to Brewster for an amazing education for her, and I really love Brewster. Sometimes I really hate him, too. Um, and I really, really feel for the Green Street people because I live on Clark Road, right across from Toad Hall, and um, um, some of you may have seen, I sent a, a last winter, I, I was in, inside my house, and I heard this high-pitched noise, and I was like, what the heck is that? And then I went outside, and I was like, it's like, in the summer we hear noises all the time because of all the construction. I was like, what is that noise? And I, I, I followed it, and I came to the compressors, and I, and I, and I did it later on. Um, I videotaped it, and I have a recording, and, and I really, really, really appreciate that Brewster has responded, and I feel satisfied by it. I hope that that will contain it. I'm, I'm sure, you know, on that piece it will. There, there is something I'd like to say that I, I take full responsibility that last year I didn't, I, I got the notice and I just assumed when I got the notice about a temporary ice rink, I guess it was temporary approval, not temporary ice rink, because they had the ice rink over on DeWolf Field and I thought they were just getting a permit for it. I'm like, that's great. Um, I love hearing the kids. I love hearing the kids at the dorm across the street from me and you know, I, I hear a lot of kids. It's not about kids not having fun. Um, so I, I, I guess my, I'd say two things about that is that I, it would have been nice if in the notice that the abutters got, because I'm an abutter, that it was clearer that it, it's not, I thought it was a temporary ice rink like they all did, and it was instead a temporary approval for a permanent ice rink, and that could have been clearer. Secondly, Brewster, and I know that I really sincerely believe they are really working at being better neighbors, and that they could have reached out to us as well, like they did with Toad Hall, and they got us together, and they told us what the plans were and so forth, and heard our thoughts. On that piece, I do remember very clearly when we met about before, when they were notifying the neighborhood that Toad Hall, Hall was going to come in, they said, and there were many things that they said, one of which was, and the lights will go off at 10 p.m. every night. The lights have never gone off. so. Which leads me to another thing, which is many of the things that have been mentioned here, I hope that they're built into the approval um, of specific allowances. Are they allowed to have games at night? I mean, after, yeah, right now their plan is only to have two to four events a year, but what, you know, what about in two years, three years? So, um, um, you know, lights are going to be turned off. What if they're not? Um, you know, I, I call Brewster a fair amount about some of the noise that happens over, like, the dumpster being picked up at 5.30 in the morning. And it's still, no, oh, it's moved to 6.15. Um, so um, so I, do, I do, I am concerned, concerned about that. I think it's a really sad situation because I agree that it's a, it just, I, I, the, the analogy I use is I, I put my compost bin right on my property line with my neighbor. And because I can, I have the right to, whatever. And they said to me, Nancy, do you mind moving that? We really don't like that there. And within an hour, I moved it <laughs> because I could move it. And it's not about what you can do or are allowed to do, but it's about being a good neighbor. And I, you know, it's a really unfortunate place. I work at home. If I worked on Green Street, when those games are going on, there's no way I could do conference call, and I do conference calls all day long, and that's really unfortunate for people. And there's no question that the value of their property, I'm sure, has gone down. Um, so, anyways, my I'm like I said, I'm really grateful. My issues have my issue has been it. You know, when I came over there and saw the rink, I'm like, oh my God, that is not like the little rink on DeWolf. This is a permanent thing. They had to put at least half a million dollars in it, I would imagine. That's not going anywhere. So, so as the gentleman said, I think if there are some ways to mitigate it, if it still can be moved even further away, great. Certainly make it more uh, attractive. I'm thrilled with the, the solution they've made with the um, chillers. Um, but I do think that there are... Um, you know, specific things that should be really clearly spelled out so that if they're in violation of that, the neighbors have an, uh, something that they can do. Thank you. Okay, uh, th thank you. Anyone else want to speak to this issue? Can I, can I just ask a question? Uh, how, yeah. how many acres does Brewster own? Uh, Brewster's entire campus is approximately 84 acres. 
How many? 84 acres. And is there no place else on campus so you could put this? There really isn't. If you, th if you look at the size of it, it's 200 by 85. You need a flat location where on each corner you can't be off by more than a quarter of an inch. So you need a very flat, very open area to put it. And there's no other location on campus that has that amount, that size to put a rink. There's, ten there's tennis courts there. So we okay. Put a rink on, um, on is it possible to contact the manufacturer to see if there's uh, puck on glass is one thing, but puck on board is a much different sound. Do they perhaps have something that could be installed? Yeah, I um, think Susan has, has an answer for that because she was talking with the manufacturer. About yeah, there are options for sound dampening on the boards. It's very similar to a spray foam you'd see on insulation inside of the interior of a building. Um, that is something that we have taken a look at and we can continue to take a look at if that becomes a condition of approval. Um, and we can get some more information about what decrease in decibels that uh, spray foam does but we have looked at that as an option and it is an effective way to lessen the sound of pucks on boards not on glass i will remind the board that when the lights were presented and reviewed last year they were found to be in compliance with the regulation i'm not saying that people are saying that it's bright mm -hmm. is i'm not saying they're wrong but it's a balance between what the regulations allow and what the neighbors are receptive to you know it was clear that the rink meets all the appropriate setbacks and the lights meet the appropriate uh parameters um but i'm also it it, it sounds like a very clear um need for some sort of fence or landscape fence combo whether whether the foam works on the boards or it's landscaping and fence something to keep the sound out uh from going green street direction uh, that's something the board could easily add as a condition. Um, I haven't gone through the plans to find out how much room there is between the walkways and the property lines, et cetera, but something for the board to consider. What about covering it? What about, um, you know, making it an indoor rink? Mm. Huge cost. That's just a massive expense and undertaking. I think it would be a, we'd ha be talking about an entirely new plan, so that's not in the works right now. Would you like to comment on How, uh, what we've just heard from the public? Just one one point to the making an indoor rink. Once it becomes an indoor rink, then your building codes kick in. So then it's bathrooms and it's you know egress and you know it starts to become a much bigger footprint. So while it seems simple to just kind of enclose it, I think you could do an open air something, but it's not going to help with the sound or lighting necessarily. So uh, so. I think to address those issues, yes, you could make an indoor rink, but I think the site doesn't support that, um, and it would actually be a much bigger impact. Well, could somebody please comment on what we just heard? Because what, what people are saying is that you're lousy neighbors. <laughs> well, you know, I, I do appreciate where everybody's comments. You know, we are a school, so there's always going to be activity. People that live close to the school, I think, understand that is a school. And I'm sorry, Peter, could you raise yep. the microphone a little Apologies. bit? Apologies. Thing. Um, that there's always going to be sound from noise of all of our sports, other sports that we have on campus. You know, you have tennis courts, you have all of the things that we have going all across campus. Um, you know, in regards to uh, top sides with the snow, um, he's at the other, completely other end of the parking lot, so it has you know, whatever snow issue, I think we can work that out. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with the rink, though. You know, I think we can certainly work that out. And I apologize if there's something happening with the azaleas, but we, I think we can, that seems very easily solvable, right? Um, uh, you know, for the people out on Clark Road, I mean, it's, it's almost 900 feet away from the chillers. I think that, you know, having the sound dampening insulation that we want to put, put down around it certainly should help at 900 feet away. Um, certainly the video that Nancy took is from 40 feet on our property, so of course it's going to be louder than it would be for any neighbor, uh, any abutter that we have. Um, you know, we always strive to be good neighbors. There's th 34 different abutters we tried to meet, and we knocked on everybody. Mr. Bachelor, we did knock on your door. We did try to come around and talk to everyone. We met with Amy the other day. Peter, I have a question. Sorry. I'm sorry. Could you come up to the microphone? Yeah, well, just a second. You get to, you get to talk into the. I'm Amy Hines. I live at 22 Green Street, 
And I just have a question. Yeah. Do you have? Um, okay. Can you, you please talk, talk in the mic? So we can hear okay. You. Okay. Um, there's a baseball field down in front, directly in front of the Smith Center that's never used, and it's nice and flat, and it's down, you know, where the dirt road goes, and it's to the left. And I thought that might be a great place for the rink. And um, I just wondered whether you could answer that. Sure. Uh, we did take a look at all areas on campus, and that area is uh, too close to the lake, and the compaction that we would have to get for the soil would be almost impossible to get to put a rink of that size out there. So, um, like I said, we did an extensive study on where we could place this rink, including DeWolf Field, um, and you have to have all the conditions are perfect for that one location that we put it in. For okay, the um, 22 Green Street said that the noise is really bad, and that's closer than Clark Road. Yep, I think uh, that if we if we look at uh, the noise ordinance that you guys have, I, I clearly think that we are within the sound parameters of of what noise is for things. You know, I I understand that it is a noise, um, but it is within the parameters of what are, are allowed in the code. But it, it sounds like what we've just heard is that this noise goes on all the time. Is that correct? No, it goes on when the temperatures exceed a certain point. So when the, the chillers have to kick in to cool the glycol to, mm -hmm. to keep the ice frozen. When the, when the temperature is low, like during the majority of the winter, the, the, the condenser is not required to run all the time. And I, I, m I remember having a, a conversation with you, Kathy, mm -hmm. where you actually did a site walkthrough and you heard it yourself. Yep. I, don't, I, do not, you know, I do not believe it is a, an overly exaggerated, you know, loud noise, but we are, in, but we take that to heart and that's why we're, we're gonna put the sound dampening around it, even though we do meet the requirements, but we wanna be those good neighbors and still do something above and beyond what's required. Do you have any information from the manufacturer of the sound dampener as to what attenuation it might provide? We could look into that for you. You know, it's just, it's the option that he gave us. And what he said was it should cut the sound down by at least half. I mean, that's just, again, what he, he's put these in all around the country. He said in, in areas in cities where he's had to put these in, he's able to use these sound dampening where it, it, it matches city code and things of that, like that. So I can't, Doug, I can't give you exacts, but I could get that information for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a follow-up question to that, Doug. Is there a certain ordinance that would specify wh what we should be aiming for for uh, that? Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Tavis, you were, no. no, there is no decibel limit in the regulations. Great. It's unnecessary or nuisance noise after the hours of 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Okay, we will look into it, and good to know that there isn't any specific level of decibel. I would love to address Peter's comment about um, evening games and what that might mean for the neighborhood, and just mention that we are not scheduling any evening games. They will be daytime games, um, so there isn't any, any need to worry about crowd, about uh, additional music, or intercom, um, especially in the evenings, because those games are just going to happen. Winter classics are daytime games, and that's what we are scheduling. Specifically speaking, nothing has ever been presented to the planning board suggesting a PA system or seating. Correct. Or I'm trying to think of the 15 different ways the, phone, the, the question was posed. What about seating? What about stands? What about stadium seating? What about uh, spectator seating? What about spectator stands? I said, the only thing they are proposing is the rink that's currently there in the walkways. That, that's correct. And I'd just like to reiterate, reiterate what Peter said about our relationship with Pop Whalen and the fact that we plan to utilize Pop Whalen for the majority of our boys and girls varsity games, which is why we aren't looking to add stadium seating or an intercom or host the majority of our games on our campus. We appreciate the relationship that we have with the Pop. The renovations that they did there were wonderful and they're going to only benefit our program. We're looking to use this as a practice facility with the exception of the games that we talked about earlier and a facility where we could grow our JV program, which actually could down the road lead to more revenue to the pop because we might be looking to rent more ice time for games for those JV teams once we have an opportunity to bring them out. So there is some economic benefit to the entire community um, if we consider approval of this facility. Okay, what about the use of a PA system? Do, 
is it used during a game? We don't have a PA system, and we're not proposing to have a PA system. Okay. So, no, there, there will be no PA system. Uh, okay. What about music? There is no speaker system or broadcasting system that is existing nor being proposed. Okay. I have a suggestion. Um, could you publish a schedule for practices and distribute that to the neighbors? That would probably help so they'd be aware when practice was going to be happening and to get ready. And also know that, oh, it's 8 o'clock, the light should be off. I think some of, some, I used to work at a hockey rink, so I understand what the noise is like, and it's fine if you know everybody's on the ice and you're ready for it. You're just constant, and you just put it in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. But I can see some of these other people that, you know, they're not ready for it because they didn't plan on that. You right. know, it's in the middle Julie, of dinner. What Julie, is Julie, could you talk into your mic? Yes, Thank you. Am I being quiet? No, no, but it's not coming over the <laughs> speakers. Oh, yeah, I'm not being quiet. But I, I think that might help alleviate some of the problem rather than having it, you know, like light up your life when you're making kit, you know, in the kitchen and you don't know what's going on and why these lights all on. Yeah, I think we can certainly pass that recommendation on to our athletic director um, and, and take that under consideration. Um, the evening component of your suggestion is consistent on a seven night a week basis with the exception of first night, which we hosted for the town of Wolfboro. Um, we have the rink shut down by 10 every night and the lights have been off by 10 every night. And that's something that we can commit to and be consistent with every night. Okay, the, the one thing I didn't understand, if the lights are all dark sky, how are they shining into people's kitchens or into their, where they live? So the dark sky compliant, um, regulations or I guess the um, the standard is really to mitigate um, light pollution going up mm -hmm. into the sky and it has less to do with broadcasting laterally uh, okay well right. I, I, I'm familiar with the right. hospital parking lot right and those lights are definitely down directed mm. right there's there's then it's they're not bothering anybody in the hospital mm -hmm. or any neighbors so uh, I mean that's what I thought we were talking about when we were talking about dark sky. The dark sky is really about like making sure that it's shielded from um, any light going up. So it has less to do with the, the broadcasting in like there's some lights that are wide and some that are narrow. Um, so that doesn't have anything to do with the dark sky compliant um, requirements. But to it's that end, it could be a requirement from the board that they pursue shielding on the green screen side of the yeah, lights. Right. Yes. right. Can't some of these lights be aimed? Didn't you get you know, specific yeah. ones you shielding that on. get aimed for sports? I Were don't... You, yeah, I don't know if this particular model allows for a, adjustable, like they may have, um, I think they're just set to be shining straight down. So yes, I don't know if, if have, they're hinged. If you have blank spots or dark spots on the ice, mm -hmm. that's a really bad thing. That's one reason why there's so many lights. Right. But you, you aim them to where there aren't any shadows. Mm -hmm. So I would think that that would be something that maybe after all the storms we've been having, it might need to be re-aimed mm -hmm. so that they're not shining into someone's kitchen. Right, we can take a look at the what was installed and, and, and see if there's anything that can be done for that. Does that sound right? Okay. Okay, the, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Peter. Um, the, the issue of the, the shielding of the light is something that can be dealt with reasonably easy and probably is pretty inexpensive. Um, but if you basically cut off the light getting into the people on Green Street, that would be a very helpful thing. The other thing is, and I'm going to say that um, the noise ordinance, which Wolfboro has about annoying noises, basically, um, I think that the issue of the hockey pucks hitting something and causing a very loud noise is an issue. Mm -hmm. And to my way of thinking, that needs to be addressed. Uh, you suggested there were ways to put uh, foam or something on the outside or whatever it is, but those sharp noises are things that make people jump. And to me, that's, that's a real issue which I think you need to deal with and whether it is something that we need to enforce. I don't know whether you know the answers. I don't know exactly how to proceed on that one. Um, on, the, on the level of the, the lights, I think that we should definitely uh, require shading, which is basically just a piece of metal which is gonna protect, protect the, the light. Yeah. One of the things I'm having some 
some degree of difficulty with is Wolfboro is not known, or I haven't found to be a very bashful town uh, when it comes to something that a resident finds annoying or inappropriate going on in their neighborhood. Um, I'm quite surprised to have five or six people stand up tonight and express things that I haven't heard uh, through all of last year's practice season um, with the ice rink. Uh, I think the applicant is likely wondering where all of this is coming from. Um, I, uh, yeah, I think that's the key. Well, it's yeah. temporary, but it hasn't been in operation outside of the time that it was stated to be in operation. So is I, it, isn't there a difference between surviving one year and surviving many years? Mm -hmm. I can, I can survive one year. There's, there's a Perhaps. COVID issue. Pop Whalen is no longer there. We can deal with this for a year, and that's a yeah. different situation than these people are looking at. I, agreed. So I would suggest, I mean, I know we haven't gotten there yet, but things I would be suggesting the planning board incorporate uh, into approval would be uh, fencing and or landscaping along the Green Street side, right. um, sound deadening on the boards, at least on the Green Street side. Um, the reason for doing both the foam and the fence is that the deadening is going to do some amount, but the fence itself puts the noise back on the user and prevents it to a certain degree from getting uh, beyond the field of play, if you will. Um, you know, I definitely think there should be some landscape, and as I drove down tonight and I looked through the Anderson Hall parking lot, it's really pretty unattractive. What did you say? I, I didn't understand. Land, landscaping this. in the Anderson parking lot would be beneficial. Yeah, you know, so the parking lot has e changed, Even though they have so a storm yeah, stormwater no, system. No, not right. the parking lot, the hockey rink, which you've got a perfect view of, and it looks really unattractive. Yeah. But I think, Roger, because, you know, when we came before, we didn't have, we didn't do any landscaping yet. I think with the stormwater management, there's, ton, there's lots of landscaping that's going on there. And I would, Peter, could you come I would, I would agree you. with you that, you know, it's, it's something that we haven't done yet because until we get this approval, we don't want to start any of that work, right? So certainly landscaping is on the, is on the docket for our uh, stormwater management plan. I, I might recommend that the planning board continue the hearing to give Brewster time to come up with... Um, some lighting modifications and noise deadening and landscaping provisions. Uh, I'd yeah. like to just for everybody's reference note that uh, in the town ordinances 100-5 uh, paragraph B it reads general prohibition on noise it shall be unlawful for any person to make a cause to be made any loud or unreasonable noise noise shall be deemed to be loud or unreasonable when it disturbs, injures, or endangers the peace or health of another, or when it endangers the health, safety, or welfare of the general community. Any such prohibited noise shall be a public nuisance. And so now that the public is aware of it. <laughs> well, I mean, the public is aware of it. They've just made us aware of it. But that's what I mean. Now that we're aware that it's a nuisance, it's a nuisance. So uh, can I just ask one, what time is study hall at Brewster? It, it depends, but typically it's uh, 7.45 around there at night. T until? Um, it depends on which grades, but usually it goes about an hour, an hour and a half. So 7.45 to 8.30, 9 o'clock? Yeah, probably about 9 o'clock, I think, and okay. the kids have to be in dorms by 10 or 10.30. And so then what time do they have to be in their dorms? By 10 or 10.30 depending on their grade level. So is there a real reason to keep the lights on till 10? No, the, the lights are turned off when the, when, the, uh, when the rink is not in use. So I would say there was never a time where we ran the rink until 10 o'clock, ever. I you think know. what they were saying earlier is that the lights are always to be turned off by the last person to leave the rink, but if they're failed to do so, they shut off at 10. That's why we have the automatic, the, the timer that t turns it off at the, at, the, at the latest time, just in case. Okay, but when, when I've been walking by, I mean, there are people practicing just out playing hockey. And, uh, I mean, that, it yeah. sounds like that can go on until 10 o'clock. Is that what you're saying? I think the only time that could happen is on weekends because the schedule doesn't allow for it any other time than weekends. Would you consider shutting the lights off or closing access to, to the rink earlier than 10 p.m.? I mean, certainly anything can be, can be considered, right? Yeah, just see. And I would say that, you know, 95 or 90% of the time, the lights are off pr 
before 8 p.m., before 7 p.m. I, I, if we, yeah, okay. But that, that's, that's what our schedule has, and I can show you, and we have full surveillance of the, of the lot if we really needed to get into the details, but. No, I, I would uh, entertain any comments from the planning board, but I would suggest that maybe yeah. perhaps Tavis's suggestion is correct, that we uh, continue this and yeah. try to get some more information on uh, shielding the lights and finding some more concrete information on the sound deadening capability, both of the foam that might go on the sideboards and the surround for the compressors. Right. And, and I, I guess that's another yeah. issue. Is, um, so if it is in fact correct that you were clearing the Anderson Hall parking lot previously by pushing the snow onto where the rink is now, is there a plan for how to handle the snow in Anderson Hall parking lot? The same way we did it all last winter, right? We uh, pushed the snow to the opposite corner that's closer to Estabrook Drive, and in cases where we needed to get rid of the uh, snow mound, we brought in a loader to, to, to remove the snow and take it to another location. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay, if you're going to speak, you need to come up to the mic. Okay. The snow is, is not a casual thing. There's a lot of snow that comes in the winter, and it piles up in that parking lot, and there's nowhere for it to go. Now that the ice rink is there, they can't just shove it over there anymore. Last year on, on Dow's and uh, Pierce's and mine, but especially Dow's and Pierce's, it was, I mean, there were enormous piles of snow that were pushed up halfway into their yard um, in this spring. And, and by the way, along with it, th this spring, there was all kinds of debris that was on their lawns uh, from the construction. The, the cleanup was atrocious. It, the whole thing was a nightmare. And it, it you know, it's just, it, I, everybody, as, as they've mentioned, it, it, I think the bad faith is just because we all thought it was going to be a temporary thing. Temporary in everybody's mind is temporary. It doesn't turn into something permanent, unless you're told it is, and then you accept that. But again, again, back to this snow thing and pushing it, those blades, they rip up the lawns, and, and they don't come back and fix it. It just stays at it. It's up to us to fix it. Most of the time, I'm fixing half of their stuff um, over by my area. And it's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, the landscaping crew, at one point in time, there was a gentleman that would drive around. I don't know what his, he died since, but he drove around in a cart and he kind of inspected all, all the properties and the landscaping that needed to be done. And, Nothing like that exists anymore, and it's just kind of very haphazard. You got some guys driving around on tractors and trying to mow here and there, but they don't. They barely weed whip some areas. It's a it's a very kind of a sad thing. I mean, this this whole landscape thing is a is a problem for for this group, and I I don't know what the issues are, but it's probably people, not enough help. So maybe part of the continuance would be yeah, uh, okay. If you a revised snow are, are plan you, for. Are you all I'm set? Done. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can I? All right. Can I just you. add one other thing? Is there any way that when we have a little bit more research that you could bring something in like a sound demonstration of of what it sounds like now and what it will sound like with the deadening? Because I I feel like if you could come in and will and say yeah the company says it's going to deaden the sound fifty percent. I don't know what that means. I don't have an idea of what from 100 to 50 percent is going to sound like, and it would also be good to have have some sort of an, a bar as to where you think the sound is going to be, so that when this is built, if what you're proposing and promising doesn't happen, um, then there's perhaps I don't know some some recourse or some asking of of fixing it better. I don't think we can just talk about the sound. It's it's too too much theory. But I think typically how that would be done with the planning board would be to look at available data on what they're able to produce, you know, from the manufacturer. This does it by 50%. Planning board could then put in a performance measure that after installate, you know, there'd be a, a noise sample taken by a yeah, that's what I want, is some, a noise sample. But it, but it wouldn't be bringing it in here. It would be 
you know, planning board agreed to this sound deadening with the understanding it would achieve 50% reduction in noise. So they take a, a, a meter reading before it's installed, they install it, they turn it back on, and it, they achieve 48%, 51%. That way the board can respond accordingly. Uh, okay. Yes, but it's still theory. It, it's still not really a, a good idea of how much noise there is and how much it will be deadened. Jane, I think one of the issues is that none of the code for the noise ordinance in town has any type of uh, number to it. There's not a, a decibel rating. There's not a, well, it, it's sort of amorphous. Doug just read the ordinance. Yeah, and it doesn't have a, a specificity on what the sound requirement is. So that's, it's really difficult to, to match a sound requirement that we don't have. It would still be nice, though, to sort of hear, okay, this is what it sounds like now. We install all of this, and now this is what it sounds like, just so people have something in their mind for the amount of sound. I'm not talking about ordinance, and I'm, I'm saying to deaden it 50%, it, that's all theory. That, who knows what that means? I don't. Well, and that, that's, well, okay, I'd that, like to, I, what I'd like to do is to have you take the following list and come back uh, at the next meeting, which is the beginning of September. But we do need more information on this sound barrier, as uh, Jane just mentioned. Um, you know, I'd like a, a firm schedule on the, the uh, daytime games and when to make sure that they're going to take place when where we think they're going to take place uh, i mean it must be you must be almost ready to come up with a, a schedule um, the lights we need to deal with that they should not be shining um, past the property Kathy, do you they, guys they just should not and you need to deal with it do you have an do you have some sort of specification that we can use because we use the town specification to put those lights in that were approved uh, by okay this, but this team. but what we're hearing is that they're shining into other people's properties and that isn't anything that is thought of in the uh, uh, the uh, the ordinance regulations speak to zero foot candles at the property line. That doesn't mean right. it's not visible beyond. Okay. But zero foot candles the, at the but property they, line. The, what they have said is that they're shining into their property, so they need to deal with that. Um, the uh, landscape and the fencing. We'd like to see what it is you're going to propose. Okay. Um, the uh, lights. Uh, turned off. I, I think you need to think of that and think what would what would fit your schedules, but also you know people in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, pretty much the snow snow removal. I, I think you need to deal with that, even though it's not to do with the the uh, ice rink. But yeah, and, and I oversee all operations on campus. We have a very extensive landscaping team, and we outsource yeah. a, a full landscaping for our entire property. Um, I think a lot of times, and, and I can assure you that no snow goes off of our property onto other people's. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well. Uh, so that would be a motion okay, to continue ahead, to Roger. September fifth. Go, go ahead, Roger. Motion to continue. Um, I was uh, I was not here when you came in for the temporary permit. One of the things I'm struggling with is that this will result in a net increase of 22,140 square feet of impervious surface. And under our stormwater regulations, when you go over 10,000 square feet, you need to comply with those regulations. And uh, under those regulations, you need to remove uh, 80% of total suspended solids, 50% of phosphorus, and 50% of nitrogen. And I just didn't see in the stormwater management uh, where that was addressed and that there was compliance. Roger, in our discussion last time or when you were, you were not there, the idea is that this is a time when the ground is frozen and so the entire surface is impermeable. And what? so, therefore, it is something which we said was not going to be an issue. I did design the uh, stormwater system to meet the town regulations, however, and if there are specific details that are not laid out, I can, for the next meeting, I can um, provide information on nitrogen and phosphorus removal because we are infiltrating 
all this a good amount of the stormwater up to you know whatever the the 50 year storm that is required no increase in runoff flow rate or volume off the site so it it, so, it sounds like the information is available just has to be yeah. produced and could be brought it, to the September 5th there, meeting when it's not frozen there's still impervious surface there correct there? and i have designed a stormwater system to in infiltrate and um, remediate the increase in stormwater runoff resulting from those impervious surfaces. Well, if you could just address those standards which are set forth in section 17321C1H of the, storm, of the site review regulations, that would be wonderful. Okay, I can do that. Oh, okay, well, do, do we have coverage re regulations and do they meet the setbacks according to uh, your, your review? Setback, setbacks, yes. I'll go back and see if there was a formal vo motion on okay, the previous waiver. Okay, and that's a 10-foot setback from, uh, from the Green Street properties. Correct. Yeah, yes. okay. Yeah, and the, the impervious and it, it surface. It may be that the board, I don't remember a formal waiver vote last year or not, but they are adding impervious, but it sounds like all of those... Well, I, I eyes think, are dotted I, and teaser I think crossed. we did talk about it. But right. I, I just don't remember if it was a formal right. waiver, but it has changed, so the board could reconsider that. Yeah. Okay. So I left off with Doug Breskin with a motion to continue to September 5th. Um, the list was enumerated a couple of different times and ways, including stormwater, lighting schedule, lights, landscaping, fencing, uh, the light off schedule, and snow removal to a certain degree. As well as noise. And noise, yes. Okay, so so do you think you can can come back by? Uh, yes, absolutely, no problem. We look forward to it. Yeah. Okay. All right. That would be great. One more question for you, Peter. Do you know the height of the lights that you currently have installed? I might have it. Hold on. It it it's on the previous plan, but we can get that. Yeah, I, I'm sure it is on the previous plan. I, I don't unfortunately have that with me offhand. Um, right. I think there's a full lighting detail last time. <clears throat> yeah, I think there was. I'll have to get it for you, Doug. You know, All right. I, I, you know, given just you know, looking you. at it, maybe maybe 20 feet, 18 feet. All right, and, and the reason I ask is because there's a limitation of 20 feet in our ordinance. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I know. I know that when we designed them, we designed them to make to match the ordinance. So we had uh, Long Champs Electric design it exactly for the specs that we had from the town. So. Thank you. You know, I'd assume it's around there, but I'll get you the exact height. Yes. Oh, okay. So. You're all set. You can come back, and th this will. Uh, are we going to notice this so that? No, oh, it's a continued hearing. It's a continued hearing, and and the public for September fifth will, 5th, will yes. be able to speak. Yes, the public hearing it, remains open. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. okay as long so, as there's a second. Uh, could you come up to the yeah, microphone? Uh, I would just make a comment that. It, Brewster will solve a lot of the problems with what you're talking about and make it a lot easier for all these things to happen, lighting, sound, and all that. If my suggestion would be that they move it, it is still temporary. Everything's still on the surface. All the piping, it's all on the surface. Move it 100 feet. They got the land. Move it 100 more feet into their property line, create fencing, sound systems, barriers, lighting, because that, that rink needs to be lit up, like you were saying. That rink, when it is lit up with the lights that are high, shine. And you guys have talked that, talked that over. So moving it, I know they may not want to move it, but it's still temporary. It's, it's still, a, you know, it's all on the, on the surface. Move it over 100 feet, more centered into the property. Right now it's kind of centered in the parking lot, but centered in the space. Then they can put up the fence, then they can put up the gray zones, the sound barriers, all that stuff. And, and, and I think for the campus it would be better. Everyone, you can get, at, at a later time, they can put seating around it. They can do more things. Right now, they're just jammed up against the neighbors. It's just not fair. It's not nice. And I think they're going to have problems meeting some of your goals. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, could you also, when you come back, uh, you know, explain how, why you've chosen the area that you have and if it could be moved? Oh, okay. Well, one of the things to remember is that by 
There's nothing in the regular, I mean, they can do that, of course, but well, they also I'm have... Just making a suggestion. Yeah, yeah. and I, I can speak to that, Mr. Batchel. One of the issues is that uh, the properties that we own on Estabrook Road, mm -hmm. we're bound by a by a variance, by a buffer on that side, too. So If you could talk into the microphone. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to. We're bound by a buffer on that side, too. So we have setbacks on both sides. And even though it's our property, we're still bound by those same setbacks. Even right. though Brewster Academy owns all of the property in that area, we can't move it any further. I just feel weird not looking at them. Um, move it any further over, because then it would impact the setbacks on the Estabrook Drive side. Uh, OK, well, give that some thought, and please speak to it, OK? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, OK. Okay, um, I'll make a motion to continue got the. A, got a so motion. Got to look at second. It. I second it. Oh, okay. I didn't hear him. Okay, I'll second it. Peter uh, seconded. I seconded him. Peter seconded it. Oh, P oh Peter. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys would talk into your mic, I could hear a little better. You're hoping okay. for miracles. Okay, uh, a motion has been made and seconded uh, to continue this hearing until the uh, September 5th. Is that right? Correct. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. All right, thank you very much, folks. No, uh, no. No, no, this is... Uh, it's a continuance, so a notice isn't required. This, this hearing. Are we going to have a minute? Okay. Well, we're going to talk about housing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, unless you want to wait until next time. Um, oh. Write your, write your email down. You're the short term rental guy at the end. Oh, okay. Um, discussion items. Um, housing discussion. At the last meeting, we had talked about uh, housing. Um, Doug and I said that we would get together and come back uh, with some suggestions. Uh, what uh, we did get together and what, what we're thinking is that we should just focus on, on one item that has to do with housing and that would be the inclusionary zoning. You know, we could have a discussion about it, uh, ask people to come and get, give their thoughts on it. And, and then proceed, uh, that that might be a better way since there didn't seem to be a lot of enthusiasm for um, having a forum or whatever we wanted to call it. But So that was our suggestion. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? When do you plan on doing this, Kathy? Uh, well, we, we've got to, we have to start thinking about the warrant articles, and we need to do that in, in September. And so that was uh, one of the thoughts that we could uh, propose that as a warrant article, unless anyone had you any other. what as an article? The inclusionary zoning that we proposed last year. Oh, yeah. We've got a lot of yeah. those. That can we still just yeah. boost them right up because they're already ready to go? We just need well, to fix no, the wording. No, I, th I think we need to better explain it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you were talking about the, the open forum type thing. Isn't that what you just said? Well, we maybe were you're talking not using your microphone close enough either. <laughs> advertising it and saying that we're going to talk about it. If anybody had any thoughts to, to come to the meeting. At a regular meeting? Mm -hmm. This would be a, yes. a work Regular session. meeting. Yeah, right. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, I, yes, I, good idea. I think if we framed it in terms of trying to provide more affordable housing, that, that I think is everybody's concern and would um, provide maybe a broader audience and also some suggestions. Okay, well, yeah, and that's basically what the inclusionary zoning. Yeah, is. we just shouldn't call it that. Well, it's that's, a bad that's word, what it's Kathy. called in the, the zoning regulations. I, I realize that, but nobody's going to know what you're talking about. What? For the planning board. Just call I, it a variety. I think if it were simply advertised as planning board having an open meeting to discuss affordable housing, and revisions to the inclusionary zoning ordinance, 
that would cover both bases. That covers what the ordinance is calling it, as well as something that people can wrap their minds around. Okay. All right. Um, can I just make one comment about the the Warren articles from last year? I wasn't part of the board, um, and I was riding around town, and I saw all the signs for vote no, vote no, vote no. I came in and read the ballot, and it was only then that I realized that the planning board was in favor of a lot of these things. But I, I think I'm right about this. But I, it just seemed like everything that was out there in the community was like, vote no, vote no, vote no. And, and I just wonder if some of those signs influenced people and they didn't really read. They all did. Nobody read any of it. Yeah, so I'm well, just wondering if our marketing could be a little okay. better. Okay, well, well see, and that, that, that is a good, a good thought. I think that we do have to do a much better job of presenting these things to the public so that they really do understand what we're talking about. So I, I agree. And by the same token, the planning board is barred from putting up a sign that says, no, vote yes on 2 through 10. <laughs> so the... No, oh, really, really, yes. The rules, aren't, the rules on the playing field aren't quite the same. Okay. Okay, so we, we will do that the, um, either the middle of September or the middle of October, that, that work session. We'll work that out. That would be, yeah. Uh, okay. I, uh, I think, I mean, the, the work session in September would be the 19th, but I think it's gonna, that would be too soon to try and get the word out through. Yeah, yeah right. All That's the, why I said sept, yeah, September yes. uh, or but October. October 17th is probably a good time for. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, the rules of procedure are on here, but we all have them. I, yeah, I put it yeah. on here just to remind yeah. everyone you had it right. in your packet. That's the copy that everyone voted on. So. Okay, so you all have them. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All right, uh, public comment. I am. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, could, could you stand up, identify yourself, and put that on record? No. <laughs> um, okay, minutes. Uh, we have several. Let's see, copies of minutes. Uh, First one is, uh, well. The May 16th the, the, minutes the, have been approved. They were approved. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay, that's what. And that's, I don't yeah. think we uh, have. Oh, okay, July 11th, uh, 2023. Yeah, I have some comments on the, I have some comments on July 11th. Uh, on page eight, about two thirds of the way down, uh, page what? I'm sorry. Page what? Page eight. Eight. About two thirds of the way down, the uh, where it says Vice Chair D. Breskin on purview of the Planning Board. Uh, the second line from the bottom, the one, two, three, four. The it says opportunity to know inaccuracies. Uh, why did I? Have I believe it should say show inaccuracies, not no inaccuracies. Okay. It should say show inaccuracies, not no inaccuracies. Mm -hmm. uh, then on <clears throat> page 14, the top line, uh, where I, it reads, uh, D. Breskin says, we have a pr to approve it. Is that what we said? It should say, is that what he said, not what we said? And then two lines below that, it should read, well, I believe you can include that condition as part of your motion rather than part of our motion. And then lastly, on page 19, in the bottom paragraph where uh, Brody Deshaies speaks, on the third line, it should say Mr. Breskin, not Mr. Reskin. And then at the, on the bottom two lines of that same paragraph, you should say what is about how estoppel works rather than what is about how a stop hold works. Oh. That's all I have. Um, I have a few comments. Um, and there are some wrong words uh, and typos, but um, On 
page uh, 10, third line down, it should be Glendon Street, not Linden Street. And John Sandine, I think he may be a resident on Chapel Lane, but he's not on OK Lane. Um, Did you say well, Linden Street? Is that what you're looking at, Linden Street? Yeah, it should be Glendon Street. Or something different. <laughs> or Laner? Glendon. Um, And uh, I think uh, Randy said that he parked, not packed, on the fourth line down in his comments. And then the second to last line in those comments, I believe it should be store, not school. Sorry, what line was that? Uh, second from the bottom okay. on his comments. Um, and then... Under Paul's comments on page 11, the last full line, I think it should be soil horizon, not sea horizon. Uh, under Jane's comments, uh, third line down, it should be drain into the lake, not name. What page are you on now? Page third, 12. Third one down on oh, page 12. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and then at the Randy's comments, uh, I'm not sure what coronavirus was supposed to be, but I think it was not that in the fifth line down in his comments. And then uh, on down third line from the bottom. Uh, they put a maintenance program on the plans theater. Um, I'm not entirely sure. And then the next one down, I don't think there was a jellyfish involved. Uh, and then under Tavis's comments on page 13, it should be a special exception for expansion, not or expansion. Um, on page 15, uh, I think Tavis said there were some 200 to 300 utility lights, not two utility lights. Uh, and then Uh, nine lines down, uh, it's not the position of immediate this time. I think it's the Municipal Electric Department. And Pickering House is Pickering House, not Pickering House soon on page 16 towards the bottom. Um, and um, I don't believe if we approved the, January, the June 20 minutes. Um, I think we needed some revisions made to those. And I don't believe we have any, uh, just going back, that we have any copies of the revised uh, June 6th minutes. Which I, believe, some... I believe I just received those today. Okay. So they'll be at the next meeting. And I will confess that I didn't make it to the July minutes. No, because these are too long. Right. I understand they, that they're not edited or paraphrased, but it's it kind of reads like a deposition instead of minutes to me. That's my opinion. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's, if somebody says, um, I think um, that could be... Uh, stricken. Stricken. <laughs> um, but I think Julie's right. I think 
I mean, I think it's great. We've got a secretary who's actually taking minutes. Um, as, I a, as, I, needs... as I understand, there's going to be a change to that as of the next meeting. So um, that's nice because I sounded like an idiot in a couple of these. Because yeah. um, yeah, um, um, yeah. Well, it's shorter than War and Peace. I was not get up to speed on it and it was very very difficult reading because of the I think I thinks and and typos and things like that so I so the question is but you you we... wish you were at a meeting with the jellyfish and coronavirus <laughs> oh okay well no, yeah uh, so I, I mean we somebody uh, Olivia's not here now. How is she going to get all of these corrections? Oh, that'll be a question I'll be having in the morning. Um, I, I anticipate uh, she'll be getting the corrections through the recording. Okay. So my question at this point I, I'm is... I'm surprised that she's not currently here to be able to entertain the changes. Yeah. So do we, do we wait for these drafts to be... Um, well, Condensed? there were a, n a number of comments on, was it 7-Eleven you just went through? Yeah. With, so if the board is comfortable, you could entertain a motion to approve 7-Eleven with amendments as presented. And then you would have the 6 6 seven, eighteen, <coughs> and uh, eight fifteen going to the 9-5 meeting. Oh. Well... I think I'd be a little happier seeing it, the corrections. Except made. it with the corrections, then. Right. The July 11th. I, I will. I will make it clear to uh, um, the people that I can that those corrections need to be made and presented in a time to be in the packets for the 9-5 meeting. Yes. You don't have to motion tonight. I understand yeah. wanting to see the changes. Uh, oh, okay. So I'll, I'll make a motion to accept the July 11th with the changes. Just noted. With the understanding that revised will be presented to the board at the and, 9 And revised meeting, yeah. will be presented to the board. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, what about the July 18th? They're, uh, I mean, they're just very, very long. I, I think those need to be redone before we consider them. Yeah. Okay. I, I can good. pass that yeah. along. Yeah. Can right. I can I just ask? I thought they would, you had appointed two alternates that night. I thought Steve and Julie were both alternates on that night. Oh, on which um, on the 18th? On the 18th. I'll, I'll yeah. Go, I'll go back and look at my notes. Yeah. It, uh, yes, it would have to be because there were two, two right. planning right. board members two. missing. Yeah. So. Where yeah. Is it? Right. Yeah, because I was left out. <laughs> so I remember. Um, okay. I, I have one other comment, and it's on the... Uh, on which one, Roger? Uh, it was on the Harriman Hill. And, which date, uh, oh, which oh, date yeah. Roger? On page... Uh, Wh which, which date? date? Uh, June 20. And that is, it, it makes it appear that Brad recused himself, and that was not the case. He discussed it with the board, and we all agreed that he had no conflict. But it makes it appear as though he had uh, recused himself. Okay. Okay, so are these ready to be looked at with that change? Which? The June 6th that he just mentioned? No, that was 620. No. I believe it was. June 20th, he just mentioned, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it was June 20th that he just June, mentioned. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, I just received a revised 6-6 six, six yeah. draft, but oh, Roger's okay. comment was just on the 620. Yeah, and I hate the word. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, we can... There were comments on the June 20th at the last meeting. Okay. All right, anything else for now? I will try and have revised updated drafts at the 9-5 meeting to the extent I'm able to make that happen. 
Okay, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So oh. moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you, folks.